Hello, I'm Matt Seidel, and you're listening to Do Not Click. Check, check, one, two. You're listening to... You're listening to... You're listening to... Do Not Click. Perfect. Matt Seidel, formerly known as Evan Bourne, right here. Across the world, but beside Matt, you're here in Singapore. Excellent. Yeah. How's the weather like over there, man? It is fantastic. It's a beautiful evening out. It's the sun's about to set here, and, you know, it's, it's a lovely day. I grow some cacti at the house. And I had stuck them all out in the sun, but you know we're expecting a little rain tomorrow, so I had to bring them back, keep them from getting too wet and dying. Oh, cactus is is it easy to maintain? Uh, yeah, they're very hardy, but you know one of the worst things that you can do is overwater them. That's very hard to counteract. If you underwater them, they can live for just about forever. So try and err on that side with them. But yeah, they're they're great to in that you you learn a lot of life about life from uh, growing cacti. I think you know because they'll push out a pup at just about any time. You know they're they're pretty hard to kill. And they're resilient things they can get fungi they can get all sorts of diseases but they seem to be very resilient and that's what i like about them did you give your cactus a name no i don't have i mean they all have scientific names i always call them by that by their (laughs) i guess by their professional names (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah cactus jack there's so many i'm sorry cactus jack Jack. (laughs) yeah i've called myself cactus matt but it never has caught on oh man (laughs) i think it's cool though i think it's a cool name I know that the U.S. has got great nightlife, so I imagine the night is still young for you, huh? Yeah, my night is filled with sitting in front of the computer working on some promos. Nice. Doing a wonderful podcast, yeah. <laughs> so, previously when you were in Singapore, you wrestled for WWE Live. I was there at the stadium. So, the moment you were setting up for your shooting star press, everyone started to whip up their phones to record your spectacle. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much does it hurt to do a shooting star press? It depends. I mean, if I land on the guy, that would be the least painful one. So, so a successful shooting star press is always my favorite version of it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a self-sacrifice. You know, for me, like if I could just pick a guy up and drop him on his head, I would just do that. But, you know, you just have to work with what you got and work with your assets, let's say. And, you know, I just found out what I do best and I can use gravity as a force for good in this case. with a shooting star press, you know, you know, that seems to be the most effective way to do business. I really hope it hurts your opponent more than it hurts you. You No, it's got to. I mean, it's got to, right? And sometimes I put a little knee into it too, you know? I am. Is it as difficult as it looks to execute? Because, you know, there's wrestlers like Osprey and Ibushi, you can do it standing up without the spring on the top rope. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously that wouldn't be as strong or as dangerous as going off the top. But yeah, I mean, everybody, like, I think the standing shooting star was a much more common move than the top rope shooter because of the levels of risk and danger involved inherently in it. You know, you're not going to break your neck and kill yourself doing a shooting star on the ground. You level it up three ropes and now you're in dangerous territory. And if you watch Will Ospreay's his shooting star press, it's perfect because, you know, you kind of have to throw that fear to the wind and you just have to jump. And that's what the guys who do it best do. They just jump nice. and, and rely on their training and rely on the visualizations and the years and years and years of technique and build up. You've obviously wrestled Osprey before, right? But have you recently wrestled Osprey? Well, last time we wrestled was Super J Cup, maybe 2017. So maybe it's been two years since we wrestled. But I wrestled Will when he was extremely young, when he was just a kid in Rev Pro that was starting to get some traction. And I really feel like he's, I mean, that kid, if I thought Will Osprey was that kid that I first met, I would be sorely mistaken. I mean, he's ascended to the highest level of wrestling. I always compare him now to like what AJ Styles used to be mm. in terms of just deliverable every night and just outrageous creativity. Well, then, you know, I say he's a lot like AJ Styles because he always does a Styles clash. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think he's a little better than that. But Will's, you know, he's just a man. He's one of my favorites to watch. He's one of my favorite people in general. Like the, the, He's just everything that's good about the growth of wrestling. Nice. Actually, after you were released from WWE, you did a podcast with Colt Cabana, your good friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, The Art of Wrestling. So, I really like that podcast because it's very enlightening. Because you mentioned you went to Peru and you did this like Washuma drug and all that. Give a very detailed experience. You shared a very detailed experience of using the drug. You know, so I kept small tabs of you here and there. The next time I saw you, you did this Matt Seidel reborn thing. And then you went to Impact and then you had the, a very spiritual gimmick, if you want to call that. So is there any connections between that trip and, you know, the evolution of your character? Yeah, I mean, the trip was a trip for personal growth. And I've been interested in and studying archaic Peruvian shamanism since that time. It's just a hobby. It's a hobby of mine. And yeah, it just plays into my everyday life. And also, you know, trying to connect with people. 
it's hard to connect just through wrestling. You have to connect on a deeper level. You have to connect at a truer place. And that's sort of that inner place that we all have, that we all share. A lot of time I do these interviews and people ask me, oh, what's the difference between people from this place and the people from this place? And what's the difference between a person from Singapore and someone from Japan? And, and what's a wrestling fan in Mexico compared to a wrestling fan? And for me, all I do is go around the world and see the commonalities. I get to go around the world and see people who are trying to take care of their friends and their family and have a good time and enjoy their life. So, you know, my world perspective bleeds into my wrestling because what you see is what you get. I'll go in the ring and fight for it and I'll step outside the ring and fight for it too. Mm. And you mentioned to me that you were here in Singapore on holiday with your brother before, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, aside from WWE Live. So once upon a time, Matt Seidel was walking around the Singaporeans without us knowing it. Yeah, I was just a tourist hiding around, you know, just exploring. My brother and I have done a number of just vacations throughout Southeast Asia, and Singapore was one of our favorite stops. We just really enjoyed the feel of the city. You know, he was coming from South Korea, and I was coming from Japan at the time, and we both really enjoyed what Singapore had to offer. We just spent like three or four days there, went and saw the Merlion, you know, <laughs> nothing too wild. You like the food here and the, <laughs> the weather? No, the weather was really nice. The food was great, too. It was it was wonderful. We just walked around a bunch, and it was nice. I believe we went to know it was Indonesia. We went afterwards. So it was much, you know, it was a little bit better conditions than when we were backpacking through Indonesia. Nice. But, you know, I also enjoy the opposite of that. So that's for me. It's like wrestling is the same way. You know, you got to enjoy the opposite to find the balance. All right. So when you left WWE, obviously, you couldn't be able to use the Evan Bourne name anymore, right? But had they allowed you to continue using the name, would you have stick to Evan Bourne or would you have went back to Matt Seidel? I'd like to change my name to Dr. Coca-Cola McDonald's. <laughs> Why? No, man. I just do Matt Seidel right now. I'm really happy doing that. Mm. People like me, you know. I'm the wrestler Matt Seidel. That's about what most people get. You know, if you work for WWE again, then I would probably go back to Evan Bourne. Don't you think that you've built a lot of body work for Matt Seidel that, you know, if you came back, I know the fans are smart enough to know who Matt Seidel is at this point, but would you still rather go back to Evan Bourne if you're in WWE? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I definitely think that's what I'd like to go by. In fact, you know, it was fun when I did it. Wouldn't mind doing it again, mm. you know. So, but, I, you know, I'm just very happy being Matt Seidel. You know, my pro wrestling tees are okay. Yeah. People can go out there and support me. Matt Seidel or uh, prowrestlingtees.com forward slash Matt Seidel, S-Y-D-A-L. Uh, you know, I just appreciate the support. You guys can follow me on Twitter, too. Hopefully you can put some links to that. But yeah, you know, I just like connecting with people from all over and sharing kind of what I enjoy with everybody else, whether it's a certain type of wrestling. Like I've got this match coming up this Saturday night at Defy at Washington Hall in uh -huh. Seattle. Nice. It's six man tag me and my teammates against him and his teammates in a six man tag. You know, I mean, there's so many things that I'm excited for. I just want to share these matches with everybody because I really am making fun stuff. And I know it's tough to support a wrestler when they're not on your TV. They're not on the TV shows you watch. But, you know, I try and make it accessible to people and, and give them ways to watch the matches that I've had recently, like one me versus Matt Riddle, which was a fun one that I did in Defy. Back when my neck was still really, really hurt, I somehow managed to survive that one. <laughs> that was a really fun match that I had with him. You know, so I'm doing matches with the guys fans love. I mean, I just was putting up pictures from the last time I wrestled Kenny Omega. That was a few years ago. Hmm. But, you know, I, I constantly stay working with the best guys. And that's the most fun thing in wrestling for me is getting to work with the best wrestlers. So no matter where you're at, the locker rooms are what makes up the company. Right now, there are so many good locker rooms. I feel really lucky to be able to wrestle around in all of them. When you mentioned you wrestled Kenny, are you talking about the one in New Japan? Yes. How was it like wrestling in Japan? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I, I loved wrestling for New Japan. You know, New Japan and Dragon Gate are my two favorite places that I've wrestled. And I wrestled Kenny also in PWG. And PWG's been a place that I, I look forward to getting back to. I had to take some time off because of a neck injury. That's why I've been out most of this year. I had this neck injury and my shoulder was involved and I had knee surgery in January. So I, in January, I was a bit of a wreck. I would have been better off had I been in a car accident, you know, just uh, <laughs> knock, on, knock on wood. But <laughs> uh, say that. <laughs> yeah, so I just had, had been built, you know, really taking the time this year to get rested and to get healthy and to get healed up so I can make that run. So I can really put everything I have into these next few matches. So I'm really dedicated to my work. Like you said, when I was called, I'm working on it during this week. Every night I'm training. You know, I've got two students about to graduate and two more students that are pretty close and a handful of people that are just walking in the door. You know, then again, whether you're in Singapore or anywhere, if you enjoy wrestling, 
the most fun thing you can do is to experience it firsthand to get in a ring and see if you enjoy it, see if it's any fun. <laughs> uh, but I highly recommend it as it is my happy place. I'm not sure if you remember this. When you were wrestling Kenny in New Japan, he did this promo and he said, you stole my hair. Do you remember this line? Okay, forget it. I'll get my title some other time. Matt Seidel, I'm going to kill you for stealing my look. Next time, it'll be me against you. Goodbye and good night. He said what? He said you stole his hairstyle. This is just in a YouTube promo. <laughs> but your hairs look nothing alike, so I'm not sure what he was talking about. Maybe he was just like a spur of the moment reference. But no, I mean, we both have long black curly hair, kind of. Mm. I don't know, but honestly, I don't remember him saying that. So, but I did. I don't take offense. You know, you no. can say whatever he wants. I suppose it was pretty funny. It was for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion, right? And he's already went on to be the world champion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and speaking of world champion, your former tag team partner, Kofi Kingston. Yeah. Yeah, well, he also doing well. You have the golden touch, man. Whoever you wrestled with has gone on to become champions. Kofi and uh, Kenny. Well, you know, it's just I'm spoiled my whole life. I spent, I don't know how many years wrestling with Ricochet. So, I mean, just AJ Styles. I mean, I was on shows with Samoa Joe, Daniel Bryan. When I was just a kid, before I was even ready for, you know, I was just an undercard. It was very hard to find a good teacher in wrestling. So what I found was I surrounded myself with the guys who were the best and just absorbed it right through them. And, and by experiencing the matches, by going out there and working with the guys and standing in the ring across from them and wrestling them, I got a lot of my experience through what we like to call direct experience. And that's the best way to learn wrestling. That's what I teach at my school in Largo. So if you want to head on down, we even have housing down here. So if you can head out of Singapore in, I think it's about 12 hours, maybe 15 hours, you can be here in Largo. Just out of curiosity, I've always wondered this. How do non-Japanese wrestlers communicate with the Japanese wrestlers if they wrestle each other in a wrestling match? The language barrier, how do they overcome it? Well, so luckily wrestling is a very physical sport. There's not as much communication needed as if you were trying to make a treaty or something. Mm -hmm. And it really, it speaks for itself. And a lot of wrestling moves are have universal names. And I truly believe in my heart of hearts, in the same way that music is a universal language, Wrestling amongst wrestlers is a universal language. And if someone is trained in the art of pro wrestling, we all speak a similar language and we can do it with just grunts and, you know, knife edge chops, but we can relate to each other. And if you're trained and you're in the club and you understand what it means to step in the ring, like what it means to honor all the guys that have come before us and all the guys that are going to come after us, you know, the real respect for what goes on in there. When guys get to that level, you, um, I sort of lost my train of thought. No, but. no, it's uh, it's almost automatic the connection between the two wrestlers. Yeah, yes, and so it's it's so wrestling is it's a universal language. It's only like I was saying, it's only the direct experience. You just have to go out there and smash it out. You have to bang it out, as we say. You know, you got to get out there and get, work a sweat. In fighting, a lot of the time they call it feeling out your opponent. Hmm. So you know, you just feel out your opponent. You know, you just don't rush things. You take your time and then you pick your spot. You know what I mean? Like some guys are easily to move left or right. You know, some guys you got to bait them in and then you can move them around. It's different techniques. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to let a wrestler think he's overpowering me and like starting to back me up to the ropes. Mm -hmm. And then I use that momentum against him. I slide underneath, dip under, change to a way slot. You know, now I'm in control. You know, so some of us are playing a chess game from the minute we get out there. Some guys are going to just try and use their power. Some guys go straight to hitting. That's what's really fun about wrestling is you might have never met somebody, walk in, shake the guy's hand, and then you have to put your life in their hands and do something crazy in front of thousands of people. And that challenge, the ability to adapt, the ability to think on your feet, that comes from really good training. And, you know, that's really like the nature of wrestling. Nice. I got a couple of questions here for my fellow favorite podcaster in Singapore. They are a wrestling podcast called Kick to the Gut. Hello, kick to the gut, open your third eye. <laughs> so a couple of questions from them. How did it feel to take that RKO from Randy Orton, the Shooting Star Press transition? Does people still talk about that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I get asked about it all the time. I think it was a special moment for a lot of people. I'm glad I could be the executor of that one, getting executed. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, there's nothing fun about that landing. I'm not looking to have that happen to me a second time. Once was plenty. <laughs> Whose idea was it? Was it your idea or is it a combination of both? I mean, it's just with two guys. Something like that can only happen with moves that have been mastered. You know, this wasn't two guys doing things that we've never done before. It just takes two masters of their specialty to make that moment happen. Okay. Who was your favorite WWE opponent? And who's your favorite indie opponent? My favorite, I'll give you two favorites for WWE, Chavo Guerrero and Mark Henry. 
And then my favorite indie opponent, I mean, it has to be the Young Bucks. Oh, <laughs> very difficult to have bad matches with all of them. That is correct. <laughs> We've come to the end of the podcast, man. Thank you so much for spending your time doing this. So what are your plans for the rest of the day? Yeah, my pleasure. Well, real quick, I just want to object to what you, call it, you would you refer to my trip in Peru as a as taking a drug when it was, you know, clearly under medicinal circumstances and more a therapeutic device than an actual drug. And that's a mischaracterization that, you know, we just need to clarify uh, um, right. because that's truly an inaccurate view of what occurred, of what transpired. So it's using ancient shamanism in a therapeutic setting to help people. So to call it a drug is really like a mischaracterization, not oh. just of me, but of an ancient tradition. You know what I mean? It's almost like a religion. And that's why a lot of people aren't comfortable talking about their religions publicly. And it's so, you know, it's not something that I take too casually. And I just kind of had to make a little correction there. Uh, I didn't mean to not paraphrase it the right way. I understand. No worries. Okay, you just end the podcast with just a message to the listeners. All right. My message to all you guys is that thank you for listening. But the best things you can do is pick up a book, go for a walk in nature, really work on opening that third eye. Transcendence awaits each and every one of you. You have all the answers. Peace, love, and pro wrestling.